On your Wednesday episode of Locked On Raptors, offense? Really? Threes? Bench production? The Raptors got it all. In a 132-120 win over the Hornets, we will break down why, even though it's against a horrible team, there is still plenty to be excited about from what we've seen from the Raptors from the last couple of games. It's all coming up on today's episode of Locked On Raptors. Thanks so much for hanging. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1318 of Locked On Raptors for Wednesday, January the 11th. I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for nine seasons on all various platforms. You can find all of my work over on Twitter at Woodley Sean. You can follow, subscribe to, rate, and review the podcast for free on your favorite podcast apps. And we are, of course, on YouTube where you can go hit the big fat red subscribe button that's screaming at you right in the face it's much appreciated when you do that and in just a second here i'm going to tell you how subscribing to the locked on raptors youtube channel could win you something free we'll get to that in just a sec uh before we do that let's set the table on today's show we are going to dig into the toronto raptors win over the hornets 132 120 a game i was in attendance at which was a lot of fun got to sit in the lower bowl because them tickets not quite as uh, ludicrous as they used to be when the raptors were good uh, i actually want to talk about that in the good the bad and the hmm later on in the show we're going to dig into the bench performance once again nick nurse rolling with a gary trent jr plus four bench dudes lineup for long stretches of the game and it's kind of working. We'll get to that, and uh, we will start off digging into the Raptors' offense in this game, which had maybe its best performance of the season outside of maybe that Cavs game just before Christmas. Before we do that, however, I have to give you a little announcement. February the 7th, our pals at Raptors Republic are hosting a live night of Raptors podcasting. It's going to be awesome. Multiple panels uh, throughout the whole night at the Rivoli on Queen Street West in Toronto. And I will be on one of the panels. I'm very excited to do that. I will be, I think, on the first panel of the night. So uh, that's going to be a ton of fun. Tickets are available right now. If you go to Raptors Republic on Twitter, their pinned tweet has the link. But this is where you can win some free stuff. I'm going to be giving away a pair of tickets to this wonderful event. All you got to do to enter this here contest is go and send an email to LockedOnRaptors at gmail.com. When you do that, include a screenshot that proves you are a subscriber to the Locked On Raptors YouTube channel. In addition, just tell me who's your favorite deep cut Raptor of all time. Do you like Keon Clark? Do you like Landry Fields? Is Patrick Patterson your cup of tea? Whatever it might be, let me know. Give me a deep cut Raptor who you like for some reason and a screenshot of you uh, subscribing to the Locked On Raptors YouTube channel. I will make a draw, pull a draw in a couple weeks' time and pick two, uh, or sorry, pick one winner to win two tickets to the wonderful live podcasting event at the Rivoli on February 7th. It's going to be a ton of fun. Come on out. Support the folks at Raptors Republic. They're doing wonderful, independent work covering the Raptors. They're a subscription-based site right now because they're trying to make money and pay writers for their wonderful work. They're doing a great job. Samson Folk, Lewis Zatzman, Katie Heindel, a whole bunch of other folks will be there. People who have appeared on this podcast, familiar faces, so go check it out. LockdownRaptors at gmail.com is where to hit me up. With that email, all right, let's dive in now to the game against the Charlotte Hornets, 132-120. Again, I was at this game. Uh, I got the text from my cousin. It's kind of our customary thing. He checks out the, the ticket sites for midweek games against bad teams. And if uh, I'm around, well, I'll just hop on a train or drive into the tr into the city to go watch the Raptors play a bad team. And they're 2-0 and when I go this season. It's pretty cool. Uh, either way. In this game, I think the big sort of takeaway is that the Raptors actually had a real-looking offense for pretty much 48 minutes of this game. You didn't see the droughts that typically accompany Raptors games. They put up 132 points. I believe it was a season high. Yes, a season high 20 made threes on 44 attempts. Uh, the process in this game looked really good. They crashed the offensive glass and did that thing that they usually do so well as well. And the offense was good enough to withstand a really excellent offensive performance from the Charlotte Hornets, which, you know, you don't want to be giving up excellent offensive performances to the Charlotte Hornets necessarily, but 
They held LaMelo Ball to 9-22. Really, this was about Mason Plumley kind of having his way, being large and sort of just finishing around the bucket, and Terry Rozier having a ridiculous, insane shooting night, which he just does against the Raptors. He's like the new Gerald Henderson at this point. Um, but other than those two guys, really, I thought the Raptors did a pretty good job. And... You know, the defense is not the highlight of this game. The offense is where you kind of focus in if you're trying to be positive. You know, yes, it's against the Hornets. Yes, the Hornets are the number 27 defense in the half court in the NBA per cleaning the glass. No, they don't have a single person with a dream of containing Pascal Siakam in single coverage, yet they still ran a whole lot of single coverage his way, which is funny. Um, But the process for the Raptors in this game undeniably really encouraging especially when you pair it with the last game against the Blazers where also despite a couple of droughts I thought the offensive process there was really strong as well and it's happening for a couple reasons right I think Pascal Siakam is sort of you know we talked about last uh, time we talked about a game against the Blazers you know Siakam's going through this sort of phase right now where he's sort of adjusting to the extra attention the Raptors are sending his way and adjusting to the way the Raptors are not guarding Scotty Barnes and thus crowding the lane, making it a little bit more difficult for Pascal to operate. And so he's kind of playing a little bit more of a pick your spots type of role. He doesn't have to run every single offensive possession, which is awesome. And we're seeing Scotty Barnes, I think, really realize, oh, uh, there's a lot of space for me to operate within here because teams are not guarding me. I'm going to do something with it. We talked about this on Monday's show, but this was just kind of a doubling down of that. And while Barnes only had seven points on five shots in this game, I think he was really instrumental to the way the Raptors were able to succeed in this game. And look, sports, any sport in the world that is a team sport, uh, that is, is about getting players who are talented into space in which space they are able to operate and do the things that score you points and, you know, rack up wins. And really, everything, every offensive action, everything that happens on a basketball floor is with the idea of, all right, we got to get a player into space with which they can operate and do something special. If a team is giving you all sorts of space, you've already, like, you know, climbed over the first hurdle. And the Raptors are currently being granted that advantage by teams that are not guarding Scotty Barnes. And I think Scotty Barnes is particularly adept to be able to exploit that extra space, the runway that big men are leaving him in the middle of the floor, because he's a really good player operating from the middle of the floor. You give him a head of steam, he can drive, as we saw last week, into Brook Lopez and score over the best rim protector in the NBA. Uh, He's got that push shot game, which is really nice, and he's also just a bloody, brilliant passer, and that was really what was on display last night, not so much the scoring. If he wanted to score over Mason Plumlee, I'm sure he could have. Uh, like It's not like Plumlee is some incredible defensive force or anything like that. Again, he's the center on a team that is 27th in half-court defense and is one of the worst teams in the NBA. Um, you know, Barnes could have gone and, you know, probably put up 25 in this game if he really, really felt like it, but instead, he was in facilitator mode. He was just spraying out gorgeous kickout passes to OG Ananobi and Fred Van Vliet and Pascal Siakam, two assists to Siakam in the first quarter on his two made threes. Uh, and, like, the vision that Scotty Barnes has, it's why he's such a weapon in the middle of the floor, and I wonder how much longer teams are going to grant him that space because the last couple times out... He's really weaponized it. The Raptors over the last two games, 125.1 offensive rating per NBA.com. That is like unheard of stuff for the Raptors who have been humming along at a pretty meager clip all year offensively. And I just think Scotty, you know, again, you give him that space. You allow him to sort of, you know, use his body. He's a screener. He's doing dribble handoff stuff. He's getting downhill. He's driving into the teeth of the defense and spraying out. Like, that's just a really great way to use a guy whose first inclination has always been to be a playmaker, to be a guy who sets other guys up, puts them in positions to succeed. And for a team that has a lot of mouths to feed, you know, Siakam, OG, Fred Van Vliet, Gary Trent Jr., all these guys are sort of, you know, I think Pascal sort of in between OG is certainly a shoot first guy. Gary Trent Jr. is shoot first in everything he does. Fred Van Vliet even as well, although he had eight assists last night and is a pretty good playmaker himself. Kept the ball moving, kept the offensive possessions kind of alive last night in a few instances. But what better way to sort of make sure all the mouths are fed than by the enormous spoon that is Scotty Barnes spraying out gorgeous kickout passes. Obviously, it helps that they were knocking the threes down as well in this game. They're not going to go 20 of 44 all the time, but all you can ask for is good process, and I think Scotty Barnes is kind of realizing, oh, I can be a real weapon here for the Raptors. I also thought 
again, not a banner game for the Raptors defense by any means, but I do think Barnes was maybe outside of OG who had some really incredible on ball moments last night. Uh, you know, I think Gary Trent Jr. had a nice defensive game too, but I thought Scotty Barnes was pretty effective as like a rim protector. He had this beautiful transition stop in the fourth quarter, I want to say. Uh, you know, I think on Miles, uh, on Mason Plumley. Eh, God, the Plumleys. What? When, when will we be rid of the Plumleys? Uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I thought his rim protection was pretty solid as it's been for long stretches of the season as well. Um, yeah, just uh, a good all around game from Scotty Barnes. And I think indicative of the process we're seeing that's improved for the Raptors in the half court. Um, and, and, you know, he's a big reason for it. So hopefully they can continue it going forward. If teams adjust and realize we can't give Scotty this space, it'll be on him to readjust. That's the life in the NBA. Um, but as of right now, this new sort of role where he's this super sort of role player in between guy, just sort of setting dudes up, keeping the ball moving, greasing the wheels of the offense. I'm liking it quite a bit. As good as 7.5 rebounds, seven assist game as you'll see uh, last night, despite the defense for the whole team not looking very good. And, you know, again, I think he was kind of party to some other better moments for sure. We're going to come back on the other side, going to dig into the bench, which once again performed quite admirably. Uh, we'll dig into what I'm liking about the sort of new Gary Trent Jr. plus four dudes bench looks, and what I'm not liking about them, and some thoughts on Precious Achua, who was hitting threes last night which is a pretty big deal. We will get to that in just one second. However, before we do that, got to tell you about our friends over at Prize Picks, who are making daily fantasy sports fun, easy, accessible for all. No longer do you need to go through the rigors of a full fantasy season where you have to set your lineup every day or every week or whatever it might be. It's laborious. It's not all that fun. And the people who take it too seriously make it not so fun for those who just want to be casual. You can be casual with prize picks. You can just go on any night you want. Maybe you are going to a game. That's typically when I like to play sports betting or games or anything like that. When I go to a game, that's when I'll sort of get, you know, get into it. Prize picks, awesome. Go to a game, pick the players in the game, and say, hey, you're going to get more or less than your projections. If you pick, you can pick two to six players in an entry. If you get all six players right, 25 times your entry is what you're going to earn back. That's amazing. No competing against other people. It's just you against the projections. And every sport is on the table. And I mean every sport. NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, men's college basketball, <gasps> women's college basketball, soccer, WNBA, esports. Sports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, disc golf, Europe, European basketball, cricket, and more, all there at Prize Picks. They got safe and fast withdrawals, operational in over 30 states in Canada, except for in Ontario in Canada as of right now. Download the Prize Picks app, go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match if they put in $100 using the code locked on, meaning you put in $100, use that code, boom, $100 appears in your account. That's awesome. Don't forget the code locked on at sign up for instant deposit match. Up to 100 bucks with prize picks. All right, let's continue on here with your first listen of the day, digging into the Raptors' second straight win. We're going streaking, baby. They will go for their first three-game winning streak of the season on Wednesday or Thursday against the Charlotte Hornets once again in uh, Raptors Hornets 2.0 before the Hawks close out the homestand. Um, as Zach Lowe said on his podcast yesterday, talking with Tim Bontemps about the Raptors and their direction. They better freaking win this game, these games, and these Hornets games are absolute must take care of businesses for sure. The Hornets stink. Um, let's get into the bench, shall we? The bench, once again, pretty effective in this game. Uh, the second straight game they roll with the Gary Trent Jr., Malachi Flynn, Chris Boucher, Precious Achua, Christian Coloco lineup, and in 12 total minutes over the course of the last couple games, that group is a plus 15, which is really just like, it seems small, and it is small, but it's also huge for a team that's just been crying for any positive play from the bench. The starters have been run ragged, just having to come back and make games interesting after bench heavy lineups, piss it all away. And that's not happened over the last couple of games. And you see the benefits of that. The minutes distribution. My God, 36 minutes for Pascal Siakam, 31 for OG Scotty and Gary Trent Jr., 33 for Fred Van Vliet. It's normal, normal, regular season minutes distribution. You get five guys playing double-digit minutes off the bench. Just a really great thing to see and a necessary thing to see for a team that if they are going to make a run here, it can't be on the back of their five best players. They will completely burn out 
probably before the trade deadline, right? Like it's just it's there's got to be some supplemental support here, and maybe this lineup has got a little bit to roll with. I am, you know, pretty ambivalent about the Malachi Flynn minutes. In fact. Uh, maybe not so ambivalent. Maybe I'm just like outright against them and I don't want to see them anymore. I thought he was pretty rough in this game. Again, it feels like it's been six or seven games in a row now where Malachi Flynn's been pretty ineffectual. I mostly thought the minutes in which the Raptors succeeded with him on the floor were sort of not in spite of him necessarily, but I don't think he was all that, um, you know, party to what was going on well. Um, you know, just, you know, one of seven shooting, he's got to hit threes. He just really has got to hit his threes. A couple of really wild decisions, driving the ball at weird times, weird sort of pass angles and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I just, I'm not really seeing it with Malachi Flynn right now, but credit to Nick Nurse. He's at least rolling with this line. I've been giving it some time to figure itself out. Maybe Malachi Flynn will find a comfort zone once again with some, you know, regular run in this group. But overall, this lineup, you know, they play a lot of zone. They ask Gary Trent Jr. to do a lot. And it's been enough against the Blazers and Hornets, you know, remains to be seen against better teams. And we saw, of course, in the fourth quarter against Portland, that lineup got blitzed by Damian Lillard to start the fourth quarter. And the starters had to come right back in. But... You know, there's a few things that are going on here. I think Christian Coloco's looked a lot more comfortable the last couple of games, crashing the offensive glass, finishing around the basket, a couple of nice little assist moments here in, in there as well. Um, you know, I have been pretty encouraged by what we've seen from Coloco. The in-season development is like very obvious um, from where he was at the start of the year where he was very Bambi-esque. And now he seems like he's passing the nose where to stand test, that all-important test for young basketball players. Uh, and he's, you know, fitting in pretty nicely in these lineups and that trio of Coloco, Boucher, and Achua, pretty interesting, especially if Precious Achua is going to hit his threes, which he did last night, three of five from downtown. Three of his eight made threes all season came last night. Uh, really important because if Precious Achua can keep himself on the floor with his offense, which is, as we know, a roller coaster, there's every, you know, for every made three or incredible dunk in traffic, there are three or four moments where he boots it out of bounds. As our pal Joe Wolfon said, he is capable of only incredible or horrible things on offense, nothing in between, and it might be the greatest skill in the entire NBA. <laughs> um, that's the precious experience. He's the roller coasterest man in the league, but roller coasters are fun, baby. And when you're at the top of it and it's really working well for you, it is awesome. And precious Achua, if he's hitting his threes, even at like a 32% clip, let alone the 38% or 40% he was at after the All-Star break last year, just as a threat, just as like a few extra points to throw in the bucket when those lineups are in, uh, that's massive. It really is. They played a lot of zone with that uh, trio as well out there. And I mean, that's a lot of zone <laughs> ground covered just by arms and length and makes it pretty difficult. It also helps combat the rebounding issue you always run into when you play zone, where it's just like you got multiple guys. I, you know, I was sitting on the end of uh, one of the ends for, for the Raptors or like whatever. It was the end they were shooting on in the second half. Um, in the first half, I thought like Coloco was just like doing a, a pretty impressive job just boxing out dudes, putting a body on guys. And that's stuff we weren't really seeing at the start of the season. It was kind of a nice little angle to see how Coloco was kind of fighting for position underneath from where I was sitting. Um, and, and that's great. Like, again, this in-season development's awesome. Achua and Boucher, we know that the chaos duo that, you know, can add a lot to a game that can also take away a lot from a game. But we should probably talk about Gary Trent Jr. and the way he kind of has made these lineups passable. You know, 24 points for him in this game. He goes 4 of 10 from 3. Gets to the line 8 times, which is a huge part of why those lineups have been able to survive. Is you just get cheap, easy points from, from Gary Trent Jr. Getting to the line, getting to that mid-range game. He's gotten pretty good at picking up contact when he gets to that sort of floater, long floater, push shot range. Um, and he's just, he's done a good job carrying and just providing enough offense for those groups to get by. And look, they're going to need a certain level of success from Gary Trent Jr. to make those lineups work sort of as sort of a sustainable thing. On this season, he's shooting just 32% on 2.4 pull-up threes a game. And that's probably not enough. Not, not enough accuracy, not enough of a threat for teams to be all that worried if he is your sort of main offensive engine out there. Um, he's 45.5% on the season on pull-up twos, which is a nice weapon that he's obviously kind of always had as a Raptor. But since December the 1st, 
48% on pull-up twos for Gary Trent Jr. and 44% on 2.7 pull-up threes a game. That you can work with, and that might be enough to make these offense, uh, make the offense for this group kind of work, especially if that Coloco, Boucher, Achua trio can really make it work defensively. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of reason to think that they can. Coloco has driven defensive performance for this team all season long. Uh, Precious Achua, probably the second best defensive player on this team when he's kind of up at full speed. And even Gary Trent Jr., force and turnovers, all that type of stuff. Where it kind of falls short for me is Malachi Flynn. And I do wonder if we sort of see this type of lineup evolve over time where maybe we start to see a little more Siakam in that group in Flynn's place. Siakam performed so well last year in those lineups with Boucher and Achua. Um, you know, he was the guy who kind of made those gigantic weirdo lineups work pretty well because his offense is just enough. And the way him and Gary Trent Jr. play off of one another, I'm not saying do it all the time because you want to try to prevent Siakam from playing a million minutes, but... If you can get by in stretches with just Siakam and Trent and, you know, inversely, just, you know, Fred Trent or sorry, Fred Barnes and OG, maybe there's a way to navigate games that way and still not have guys play a million minutes and also maybe not have to play Malachi Flynn all that much because he just doesn't affect a whole lot out there. To his credit, he was a plus nine in this game. Um, again, I think he was kind of carried to that by the guys he was playing with in large part, but, um, you know, it, it, it's... I can't help but think, like, what would those lineups look like if just, like, Monte Morris was in place of Malachi Flynn? Just, like, a competent, steady backup point guard there to sort of steady the ship, reset the offense when need him, you know, offer a second guy to run pick and roll and stuff next to Gary Trent Jr. Maybe that is, like, the small little adjustment. If Christian Coloco is going to continue this sort of in-season trajectory to becoming at least a passable player, if not a good player, a passable rotation player in 15 minutes spurts, you know, spurts throughout games, 20 minute, 21 minutes last night, if you can get that to work while also sprinkling in just, like, a, a little bit more offense, a little bit more, um, you know, ball handling in the form of a small point guard addition, Maybe that's all this team needs to kind of stabilize itself. And look, it has stabilized itself in a lot of ways. They're 5-5 five and five in the last 10. No great shakes, but they're not just hemorrhaging and losing games all over anymore. And they seem to have kind of found some process and some things that work. It feels more sustainable. Um, and that, those bench lineups, credit to Nick Nurse for running with them and giving them actual time to sort of, you know, you know be patient and, you know, nourish themselves and kind of get get a feel for how each other plays. Flynn still feels like the weak link to me, but, you know, I'm I'm picking nits at this point. It's really nice to see the bench putting in good work. And um, what, was the, what did they get last night? Just quick math on the fly here. 25, 30, you know, 40 points from the bench. Uh, that's like unheard of stuff this year for the Raptors. Really, really good to see. Um, and, and we'll see if they can continue go, going forward against better teams, better competition. Um, I would imagine they'll stick with the sort of rotation we've seen the last couple of games against the Hornets on Thursday night. When things get more difficult on the upcoming road trips, then we'll see. But I'm encouraged. And Gary Trent Jr. bombing away the way he is, that makes it a lot more viable for sure. You would like to see a little more playmaking, of course. He's still only averaging like one and a half assists a game. Um, he's never really looking to pass all that much, you know, outside of the odd sort of weird pick and roll he'll run with like Scotty Barnes, which is kind of fun. But if he's going to bomb away and hit a couple threes to keep those lineups afloat, that is maybe all you need to keep the, the starters' minutes down just enough to make them potent enough to carry you through to a bunch of wins. We'll come back on the other side, get to the good, the bad, and the hmm, including some talk about Otto Porter Jr., who some bad news about came down yesterday after we recorded the show. We'll talk about that, what it means, in just one second. Before we do that, however, I should tell you about our friends over at betonline.net, your number one source for sports betting odds, lines, and info all season long whatever the sport is obviously college football is over now i think right last night was the championship game but you've got the nfl playoffs coming up you've got of course the nba season nhl season mlb futures are out there wnba futures are on the board as well bet online has all the information as to why the lines and odds are set the way they are so you can be the informed wagerer and know hey this is an informed bet that i'm putting down this is not something where i'm just tossing away my money because i have a gut feeling Gut feelings are never the way to go. Bet Online is going to make you informed and make it so you're making the right bets at the right times. If you love sports podcasts as well, they have podcasts to give you all the analysis you want, injury reports, the whole nine yards. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online is where the game starts. All right, and we continue on here, rounding up the show with the good, the bad, and the hmm from the Raptors win over the Charlotte Hornets last night. 
My good is uh, OG Ananobi having himself a night from three-point range. He goes for uh, 22 points, 8 to 12 overall, 6 of 7 from deep. Uh, had a really nice defensive showing, I thought, too, despite no counting stats to speak of. But I thought as much as Terry Rozier went nuts and had a really uh, put on a tough shot-making clinic, I thought those shots were made tough in large part because OG was haranguing him. Um, you know, we, we know that's part of OG's game. The three-point shooting, though, is what's really nice. Um, obviously, a bit of a rocky start to the year, but we're seeing the team is now stabilizing in line with the positive regression to the mean for both OG and Gary Trent Jr. from three. Since uh, December 1st, OG's at 31, 39% up from where he was to start the year, around 34, 35. Uh, and since December 19th, when he got back from injury, he's at 43%, in which time the Raptors are five and six, which again, no great shakes, but beats the hell out of six game losing streaks. Um, you know, it's really encouraging. They're waiting for the dam to break for Fred that, you know, and we're starting to see that a little bit. The two late threes again, back to back games, two big late threes for Fred. That's great to see. Didn't have a great overall night. Uh, did Fred from three, two of seven, I think it was, but still those threes go in. At some point, it feels like the dam's going to break for a guy who has always been a 38 or above three-point shooter. Uh, so, yeah, that's my good. Positive regression to the mean. Very, very positive indeed. Uh, let's go to the bad. Otto Porter Jr. It was announced yesterday he's having surgery on his toe that was dislocated, was not healing, and he will be out for the rest of the season. And this sucks. It sucks because Otto Porter Jr. is a fun player to watch. He's a bench dad type, which is like my favorite kind of player. Um, you know, in theory, his length, his, you know, his heavy hands, his rebounding, his deflections, his three-point shooting, his like modicum of, you know, ability to put the ball in the deck and sort of attack a closeout. That is a really valuable thing that the Raptors just did not get at all this season. They had eight games of Otto Porter Jr. It seemed by the time he had ramped up, he was out again and it's a bummer the Raptors not had great luck with their mid-level exception signings over the last couple of years Aaron Baines of course um you know had the the really sort of disastrous season um that led to a really dark time in Aaron Baines's life glad to see he's kind of turned things around read the Brian Windhorst story on Aaron Baines um if you can it's a, it's a really good one and uh, I think an eye-opening one for a lot of people who were maybe kind of mean to Aaron Baines either way you know the Raptors They've had struggles signing free agents and making them sort of fit into the team and, and have them work. Svima Hailuk, you know, last season, even going back to, you know, Aaron Baines, Landry Fields, Damari Carroll, the list goes on. And finding wings to be good, you know, in free agency is hard. The, the problem is, is everyone who hits free agency hits free agency for a reason. If you're a star, it's because you want to exercise your own agency. If you're not a star, it's usually because there's a reason why the team is all right letting you walk. And, you know, you're always kind of playing with risk when it comes to guys like Otto Porter Jr. Um, you know, mid-level signings, there's always a baked in amount of risk. Otherwise, they'd be making more than the mid-level exception, or in Porter's case, a portion of the mid-level exception. It's just the reality of it. You know, I don't really understand why when a guy gets hurt, it's like the front office is like the first T, the first, you know, sort of point for blame. It's like, oh, the front office signed Otto Porter Jr. What the hell? It was a totally sensible signing. Dude was starting finals games six months ago. Um, it was one of the most, as far as like fit with the team with whom the guy signed, one of the most sensible signings of the entire offseason. The injuries obviously have been a thing for him. And maybe if you're looking to critique the Raptors, they should be looking at guys with less checkered injury histories. But again, guys who are up for the mid-level exception, you're probably getting injury. You're probably getting, you know, one dimensionality as a player or just like a guy kind of on the downturn. There's never a guarantee when you sign a mid-level exception guy. Ask even like the LA Clippers when they signed Serge Ibaka, uh, you know, our, our dear pal Serge Ibaka to the mid-level exception. That didn't work out for them either. It's This is not just exclusive to the Raptors. Mid-level signings are hard and Finding guys who aren't flawed, it, again, flawed guys go for that price in the NBA these days. And so I'm not going to begrudge the Raptors for signing Otto Porter Jr. The fit on the court was ideal. You know, locker room wise, he seems like a good guy to have around as well. And the nice thing is, I suppose, if you're trying to have silver linings here is, you know, it's not nice for Otto Porter Jr. He's hurt. He's going to miss a lot of time. That sucks for him. But the odds are now, I would guess, is that Otto Porter Jr. is going to opt in to the player option he has for next year for about $6 bucks. And if he can get back to full health for next season with all this time off, 
maybe, just maybe, Otto Porter Jr. can be a legitimate contributor on next year's team. Maybe he's a deadline guy who you can ship off to a contender depending on how things go. Or if you're just good next year, then hey, Otto Porter Jr., rotation player, sounds pretty all right. He's still only 30 years old. Um, obviously, a lot has sort of piled up for him injury-wise, and you're never going to be able to count on him to be fully healthy necessarily. But I do think $6 million bucks for Otto Porter Jr., risk and all, is totally reasonable. And I think um, it's pretty exciting to think about him on the team next season if he can get back to full health. Hoping for the best for him, of course. Um, but definitely some tough news for the Raptors. I don't know how much it will actually affect their, their plans at the deadline. It might affect their ability to sort of do bigger trades because I do think Otto Porter Jr. was kind of a sneaky you know, throw into a deal. For example, you know, the Fred Van Vliet Clippers deal I've kind of banded about throw Otto Porter Jr. into that, the Clippers might give up more to get Otto Porter Jr. as a guy to throw in their rotation, in theory, if he were to get healthy by the playoffs. That's not happening now, so I doubt that comes to fruition. But uh, yeah, interesting stuff with Otto Porter Jr. as far as what's next, but ultimately right now, it just sucks for the dude. He's a, he's a really good player who has had a really injury-laden career, and that is a bummer, and uh, hopefully he's back next year ready to go. Uh, let's get to the hmm to round out the show. And uh, again, I was at the game last night and I kind of want to circle the hmm around this. I was there and got to say, the crowd, pretty live for a Tuesday night against the Hornets. The classic Tuesday in January against the Charlotte Hornets, the sort of go-to meaningless basketball game. Um, like, the crowd was pretty popping. It was great. And, uh, you know, from all reports, the crowd on Sunday against the Blazers was also pretty awesome, especially when those Fred threes went in late. You know, apparently the roars were pretty beckoning throughout that building. And I kind of wonder, are we maybe seeing a return of the normies to, like, the lower bowl at Scotiabank Arena? I'm a normie. I was able to afford lower bowl tickets last night. It was great. I'm very fortunate. But... Also, the tickets, like getting an under $100 ticket for the lower bowl in the last five years, I think, is kind of unheard of. And that's where I was sitting last night for under 100 bucks. was in the lower bowl. Uh, it was pretty awesome. First time I've sat in the lower bowl for a game in, God, uh, like tw nine years or something like that. Um, it, it just, uh, you know, I, I think it, maybe, just maybe, the, the team not being so hot not being the hottest ticket in town. The Leafs are doing their thing. Um, you know, they're really good right now. They kind of are sucking a lot of the oxygen right now. Maybe it's just not the cool ticket anymore, which means the freaks like you and I are able to get back in the building for a reasonable price um, for a night out. Reasonable price being four times what it used to cost 10 years ago, but still, inflation, baby. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I just, the crowd's been nice, and it was been a pretty meager crowd, I think, even the end of last season, this year as well. And I wonder if just the results are maybe kind of leading it into a phase where people are able to get in the building for a little cheaper now. And that's great. I mean, that, 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 that's awesome. More accessibility for the actual fans and not the, uh, you know, the ghouls in the suits and all of that. Pretty cool. And if the ghouls in the suits are going to not want to go to Raptors games because the team's not winning, um, they want to have their sushi elsewhere, then, uh, hey, all, all of the people who can actually go to games now for a reasonable price or, you know, at least pick a game or two they can sort of splurge on or whatever, as opposed to it being, uh, you know, you have to go to your financial advisor to talk about whether you can buy a single game's worth of tickets. Um, that, to me, is a good thing. Again, it's the hmm. It might not be a thing. It might just be sort of two games and it doesn't mean anything. But for a Tuesday night against the Hornets. I thought the crowd last night was awesome, and maybe, just maybe, it's a sign of the regular folks getting back in the building. Wouldn't that be swell? All right, we're going to round it there. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back again tomorrow with everyone's favorite, the over-unders and prop spectacular halfway point check-in. I'm pretty sure I'm beating Vivek and Sahal this year. I haven't actually confirmed just yet, but I'm feeling really good. I was very OG forward with all of my picks at the start of the season. I can't wait to see how we're doing. That's going to be fun, as it always is with Sahal and Vivek on Thursday. Jamar Hines will be around on Friday. We will break down Raptors Hornets 2.0 to send you off into the weekend. If you haven't yet, go listen to yesterday's show with Josh Gondelman, the wonderful stand-up comic, former head writer at Desus and Miro. He's in Toronto this weekend. Uh, it was a really fun show with him and Katie Heindel, so go listen to that if you haven't yet. Um, also, reminder, uh, February 7th, the Rivoli in Toronto, Queen Street West, 
the Raptors Republic live podcast extra- extravaganza will include yours truly in one of the panels, and you can win two tickets right now. Send an email to LockedOnRaptors at gmail.com. Send a screenshot proving that you are a YouTube subscriber to the Locked On Raptors YouTube channel, along with your favorite deep cut Raptor of all time. I will put all those names into a draw, pull out a name in a couple of weeks, and hand out two free tickets to whoever wins very much looking forward to seeing you all there come say hi come have a drink whatever um but and i'll promote this excessively throughout the next month the links in the bio uh, links links in the bio i'm not on instagram links in the description of the podcast as well with that thank you so much we will be back tomorrow in the meantime go make locked on leafs your second listen of the day the buds are good baby mike de stefano and dave morisuti also very good go check out our sister show over there at locked on leafs and we'll talk to you thursday Bye bye